Hi, my name is Exley, and I'm from Christ Heritage Church. And while we uh, recognize the providence of God in spreading His gospel message through online videos, uh, this video may be used by God to edify you and to encourage you. But we believe that it is important for a Christian to attend a, to a local church. We believe that it is important for a Christian to be a member of a local church where he can exercise the ministerial gifts given by God. We believe that it is important for a Christian to sit under the preaching of a local pastor. And so the preacher in this video cannot and should not replace the office of the pastor in your, in your local church. Uh, it is our prayer that this video may help you, but again, we strongly insist that you don't miss out in the ordinary means of grace being done in your local church. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome all uh, new visitors. Uh, welcome back to, uh, uh, for, to those people who were here last week. Welcome back. And to those who are from a, a different country, coming from a different country, welcome back to the Philippines. Uh, you know, uh, making a comeback as well after 19 years is the polio outbreak. Now, the Department of Health sees low vaccination coverage, poor early surveillance of polio symptoms, and substandard sanitation practices as culprits in this re-emergence. And they also pointed out that the poor sanitation in communities as triggers that have put the, the country back at risk of the highly infectious viral disease. And during these times, as a parent, we really need to protect ourselves and um, our children. Uh, that is why we need to be updated as well of what's happening to our nation. Because we don't know uh, how to respond. We wouldn't know how to respond if we don't know such outbreak has already happened. Uh, such is the same in the time of Malachi when their lack of knowledge about God and conviction about their responsibility became the source of their compounded disasters. And the main issue in the passage that we're going to look at this morning is their failure to give their Tides. And our passage this morning is Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And we, again, we have been in our Malachi uh, series for seven weeks now, and it has been a blessing to be reminded of the holiness of God, but at the same time, uh, of the sinfulness of man, um, the pattern uh, that we have been seeing in the Malachi passages that we have been studying for weeks were the back and forth disputations between God and Israel. And from there, we see that again and again, Israel is being confronted of their sin. Yet despite of having a heart of repentance, the opposite of that was their response. Instead of repenting to God, instead of re returning to God, they were actually insulting God by their questions. And so we have learned the problems of Israel from their offerings to their marital problems to now tithing. Now I understand that churches have uh, different positions regarding tithing, but we need to understand what a tithe was back in the Old Testament. 
a tithe was a part of the Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law. And it was mandatory back in the covenant made at Sinai with Moses and with Israel. Now this tithe, this 10% that was given is actually tithed to the tabernacle. And well, eventually in the Bible story, we will, know, we will know that it will be tithed to the temple. It served as their tax. If we're comparing them to uh, basically to our time. Now, they were given uh, specifically to the Levites who were the workers in the temple. And then the Levites gave their tithes the tithe of the tithe to the priests. And if we want to be really accurate about tithing, there is not just one tithe in the Old Covenant. There were actually three tithes under the Old Covenant. First is the Levite tithe. Second is the festival tithe. And the third is the poor tithe or the tithes for the poor. And all of these were mandated by the law. So the Levite tithe was received only by the members of the tribe of Levi. And then the Levites in turn were to give one-tenth of, of their received tithe to the priests. So they were the only specific tribe who were to receive tithes as replacement for the land inheritance rights in Israel. As we know, unong pinaghahatian nila ang land, ang promised land noon, dahil merong 12 tribes, Hindi lahat nakakuha, isang tribo na yon ay yung Levites. Dahil sila ang pinili ng Panginoon para maging ministro, maging workers sa tabernacle. And so God, uh, the land was divided into tribes of Israel except for the tribe of Levi because God assigned them to serve in the tabernacle or the temple. And that's how the Levites and the Aaronic priests got their provision of basic sustenance. Now take note. Take note also that this tithe was also, was only applicable in the promised land as mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 19. Take care that you do not neglect the Levites as long as you live in your land. In other words, the the whole tribe of Israel were to take care of the workers. They were to take care of the Levites through their provision of tithes. And every year, the people of Israel had to set another tithe. Ito na yung pangalawa, the festival tithe. And these tithes were to be set aside and to be consumed at the Feast of Tabernacles. And then yung third tithe, it, it, they, they set aside another tithe, yung pangatlong tithe, every third year. And they distrib distribute them to help the poor. Yun yung tinatawag na the tithe for the poor or the poor tithe. So technically, if you're going to count the tithes, it's more than 10%. And so we need to understand we're not in the old covenant anymore. And if, if you have been in, in our Malachi study, we have reiterated many, many times we're not in the old covenant anymore, but we are in the new covenant of grace. We don't live in the promised land. The Levitical tribe is long gone. There is no central temple. Hebrews chapter 8 also tells us that the mandatory tithe has been discontinued. So the, as the Levitical priesthood no longer exists and we have a greater priesthood in the person of Christ. Yet some would argue that even before the Mosaic Covenant, Abraham and Jacob uh, gave tithes. Nauna pa. Nung time na binigay ng Diyos ang kanyang law, nung panahon ni Moses, nauna pa daw si Abraham at si Jacob nagbigay ng tithe, which is correct. They gave 10% on occasions in their lives. And Abraham gave to Melchizedek. And Jacob, when God met him in, in Bethel, he promised to, gi to give 10%. But again, there's no implication that it's something that they regularly did nor there's a universal command given to them and to all believers in those passages. So clearly, those are one-time temporary events. You cannot use those as arguments to say na, na tithing is still uh, perpetually practiced up until now because dahil si Abraham and si Jacob nga, eh, before pa yung Mosaic law, nagtatide na sila. 
And also, some would argue that Jesus commended tithing in the book of, in the Gospel of Matthew. But he also, but we have to take note. We have to take, we have to be careful in interpreting such passages because even Christ he commended that you forgive your brother before you before you offer your sacrifice. So, which means na meron pang nangyayaring sacrificial system ng buhay si Kristo. And we see those in those passages that, that Christ was talking. We need to be. Kailangan natin maintindihan to, that he was talking to his contemporaries nung time na yon. That even Christ himself lived under the Mosaic law, and Christ's new covenant was established, and the old covenant ended on the cross. That's why the thrust of this message is not the Old Testament tithing, but the New Testament giving. And it is really important for the church to understand the New Testament giving because a church that understands its responsibility in, covenantly, in covenantal giving has a stirring impact upon the cause of Christ. Ang iglesia na nakakaintindi ng kanilang responsibilidad sa pamamahagi ng kanilang handog ay malaki ang naitutulong para sa mission ni Kristo. When a church does not understand their responsibility, there's a big possibility for the gospel and the preaching of the word to be set aside. Irresponsible giving is insensitivity for the part of the church. And this is a common problem in the churches today. When a church lacks instructions concerning financial stewardship or ministerial support, every week, walang instructions, walang pagtuturo, or even buong taon, walang turo about giving the church may never know and understand its responsibility. And when a church always hear instructions about financial stewardship or ministerial support every week of every month, and that giving is the main exhortation in every pulpit message, the church becomes a money ministry instead. And when the church does teaching or does teach giving but it teaches that the more you give the more you get blessed interpreting Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 as God testing us when you bring your full tithe into the storehouse in their case and in their interpretation the church it will become a meritorious prosperity gospel church the money or their return on investment becomes their gospel Becomes, it becomes their hope. There are also those who teach, when you do not give, you will be cursed. When you don't give to the church, you will be cursed. Kasi sabi sa Malachi chapter 3 verse 9, you will be cursed. As it, as if, uh, it, it's as if Christ himself did not become the curse for his people. It's as if Christ himself was not sufficient enough his death on the cross was not sufficient enough that you actually need to give in order that you won't be cursed. At hindi napunta yung curse kay Kristo sa cross. Well, let's just pray that you won't be visited by locusts and pests in your houses when you don't give. And sometimes the curse is not pronounced to the congregation but to the entire country. That when a church does not give to the Lord, the whole country suffers. Again, it's a misinformed church. And that puts the burden to all Christians in the country instead of looking at giving as grace. Sometimes the church is well informed about their responsibility to give, yet they themselves are not doing it. And most of the times, the reason is that they are not motivated. And because they are not motivated, they look at their responsibility of giving as a burden. See, 
We must educate one another with what the New Testament says about giving. What should be our motive when we give? Why should we give? Is it really a responsibility? That is what we're going to understand this morning. And my two points are as follows. First is giving as obedience to our covenantal obligation. And second, giving as response to the covenantal blessing. And so giving as obe obedience to our covenantal obligation, we see Israel's stalling opened the door for God to get very specific and very personal with his rebuke. Verse 8 says, Will man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? And so the people of Israel have been robbing God for withholding their tithes. They were robbing God for hoarding their possessions. Same story in Nehemiah chapter 13. When Nehemiah found out that the portion of the Levites were not given to them, in verse 11 of Nehemiah chapter 13 says, why is the house of God forsaken? See, the Israelites withholding their tithes, they're actually forsaking God. So not to tithe in the old covenant economy was robbing God. It was a violation of their covenant. See, if we go back to the previous verses in Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, and we have uh, read this, we have studied this last week. We see after a declaration of God's immutability and a rebuke of the people's unchanging sinfulness, God gave them mercy by calling them to repent and return to Him. Yet Israel with pride responding back, insulting God by saying, how shall we return? As if they don't know how to turn back to God, turn back from their disobedience and submit themselves to God. And God confronted them by showing them the reality of their sin, of their disobedience of the law of God. That the problem is not what the people possessed. Rather, the problem is what they did with their possessions. They were withholding proper tithes from God as if God did not own everything. It's as if they didn't have possessions. They had possessions. They just withheld them. And this is why God called them to return to Him. Because the, the real problem here was their wicked hearts. Their greed over their possessions led them to their disobedience to God, which led them to compounded consequences, which led them to their inability to obey because they then lacked resources as an effect of their disobedience. They starved the very mechanism to alleviate their own poverty by defunding the religious and social structures that God has provided for their spiritual and material enrichment. They withheld their tithes. The Levites did not get anything to sustain themselves and their families. Therefore, the priests are not getting anything as well. So the workers, the Levites, and the priests made their own living by, plant, by planting crops instead of focusing on the ministry of teaching and intercession. And then add to that in verse 9, it says, You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. See, they withheld tithes, so God withheld his promised covenant blessings. Blessings that referred to their material sustenance. Blessings that will help them remain in the promised land. Instead, they were receiving the opposite. Covenant curse. So to add to their compounded collective poverty due to their disobedience. God cursed them by destroying their crops and their fruits of their soil. And to add to that, their proud, wicked hearts in answering back and insulting God with their disputations, creating a self-enforcing downward spiral. And friends, these are but effects 
of sin. And God is telling them, unless you return to me, you will be in a loop. They disobey God because of their sinful hearts. They try on their own to make it right with God, yet fail because of their greed. They would rather sacrifice the blemished animals over their, pos uh, in, their possession, in their possession unblemished ones. They would rather hold on to their tithes and not give at all or not give the entire 10%. And because of their proud hearts, they question God. And God just told them in verse 6, Return to me. Because you will be in that pattern of depravity unless you repent and turn to me. Now doesn't that sound familiar to us? Isn't that pattern familiar to all of us? We disobey God and we try on our own to make it right with God, yet we fail. And sometimes we're the ones who are proud and then we question God as if He's not doing His job. The same call that God made for Israel is the same call that He's making for us. We should always turn to Him. As we have learned last week, we should be living a life of repentance and a life of faith in Christ. Now you may ask, actually, ano pinalaman ng tithing kay Christ? Some say tithing doesn't have anything to do with Christ. Well, it does. Because the Old Testament law of tithing revealed the heart of Israel. It revealed the need for a new covenant. It revealed the need for a covenant where there won't be any curses for any disobedience for His people. It revealed the need for a covenant where the curse would fall on a substitute. A substitute that unlike an unblemished animal, can satisfy the wrath of God. And this is why they needed Christ. For Jesus Christ is the head of this new covenant. And this covenant is a covenant of grace. All members of this new covenant is under grace, not under the old covenant anymore. We are not under the law of tithing anymore. It has been abrogated in the establishment of the new covenant. We are under grace because Christ fulfilled the law by being obedient to the Father in His earthly life. He never sinned. He attained the righteousness that no one can earn. We are under grace because Christ bore the judgment on the cross that was supposedly to fall on His people. He became the substitutionary atoning sacrifice as penalty for the sins that His people has committed. And if you are not in Christ, you are in dire need of the gospel. You are separated from the special love and the special grace of God unless you believe in Christ and His work. You need to repent of your sins now and come to Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you are part of this new covenant of grace in Christ. And you are expected as a member of this covenant of this covenant family, you're expected to be into a local body of believers we call the local church. And this is where the ordinary means of grace are being observed. It is where the sacraments are being observed. And especially and primarily, it is where the preaching of the word is being done. A church, a ministry should be based on the ordinary means of grace that God has put forth as outward instruments for spiritual life and growth. God explicitly instructs ministers and pastors and churches to, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a local body is obligated to observe the Lord's Supper. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we, chapter 2, we are urged to pray. 
So all of these ordinary means of grace are not the inventions of men. They are institutions of Christ. And if Christ is the one who instituted the ordinary means through his apostolic word, and if Christ is the one who established the church that observes these ordinary means of grace, then if we neglect supporting a church for it to sustain, then we neglect the means at our own spiritual peril. The church is not under the law of tithing. The church is not under a compulsory 10%. It is not law anymore. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, If we have sown spiritually things for you, it is a great thing if we reap your material things. There should be a lawful exchange of spiritual ministry and material fruit from these from those ministered to. Thank you, bro. The sharing of material things is part of the response of the ministry of the word. And Paul sees this as a matter of divine mandate. It is, a, it is commanded, not an option or mere convenience. Comparing the ministry in the church to that of the temple in the Old Covenant, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 to 14, Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple services get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings in the same way. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Even though tithing isn't required today, it doesn't follow that believers should hoard their possessions. We are commanded to support those who preach the gospel for the preservation of the local church. We are commanded to support the ministry of the word. In the new covenant, the obligations of the Old Testament legislation are heightened rather than lessened. It is heightened because the work of Christ has been fully revealed to us compared to the Israelites. It is heightened in a way that Christians now voluntarily gives out of love and not because of the law. It is heightened because as Christians, we should actually give our all, our everything to the Lord. Even our whole body should be presented as spiritual worship to the Lord. See, this New Testament principle and freedom of giving is the sacrificial, cheerful, voluntary, and proportionately giving for the support of the ministry of the word and relief of the destitute and proper stewardship of all the rest as belonging to God. Now you may know the father of modern missions, William Carey. He, he was called the father of modern missions and he was known because of his mission, mission work in uh, India. He was known to have uh, really helped spread the gospel in India. And in 1814, he met another missionary, uh, eventually naging missionary sa Burma, si Adoniram Judson. And Carey was very influential in the life of Hudson. Actually, Si Hudson, bago pa niya ma-meet si Kerry, siya ay isang pedobaptist. Nung na-meet na niya si, si, si William Kerry, siya ay na-influensyahan at siya na ay naging baptist. And because of that, naging, naging influence din si Adon Adoniram Hudson ng mga baptist conferences in America. So malaki yung naging influence ni William Kerry. But the reason, the reason why Kerry was the reason why Carey was able to do these things, these mis these, th his mission in India and his technically mission kay Adoniram Hudson was because of his friend Andrew Fuller. 
He was the energy. Andrew Fuller was the energy behind the practical support of the mission of William Carey. And William Carey's famous words to Andrew Fuller was this, I will plumb the depths, but you must hold the rope. So without the help of the holding rope of Andrew Fuller, there may have been no gospel spread in India during that time. And there would be no myriads of Baptist denominations because of Carey's ministry to Adoniram. The church is a fellow worker with its pastors, not only in evangelism or any other ministry, but also its practical support. And friends, if you are applying to be members of a church, know, any church, know that it is a responsibility of yours to help sustain the word ministry in your local church. If the church forgets its, res its responsibility, the pastor of that church would look for a secular job to make ends meet. Yet in doing so, may sacrifice the word ministry that instead of spending the whole week studying and preparing for the Lord's day, he's doing other things. And in return, pastors must not stand out in indulgence and luxury among his people. Friends, we must seek to have an impact on the cause of Christ through covenantal, responsible giving. And our second point is giving as response to the covenantal blessing. And we see in verse 10 that God puts Israel to the test. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Yet if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now the storehouse is a big place where the goods and tithes collected were stored. Um, and God in, the, in this verse is not asking for just a part of the tithe, but the whole tithe of Israel. So you see, in the face of their economic struggles, God calls them back to covenant obedience. God calls them to repentance. And He calls them to commit themselves to faithfully trust God. He calls them to test Him. Now normally, it is God who tests. And testing God is really not a good idea. As it was actually it's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 6, sabi niya, do not put the Lord, your God, to the test. But sometimes, as in this passage, God actually invites His people to test Him. He invites them to trust His word, to act in faith, to step out and see whether He keeps His promises. And in this passage, we see that God is always the initiator. Having first pursued Israel and established a relationship with them and having made glorious promises of His goodness. But He's not just the initiator. He also controls even the produce. And we see that in verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. God will remove the curse, the crop failures due to pestilence. He will rebuke the locusts and the other pests that destroy the fruits of their soil. See, He so controls everything that He can choose to destroy their crops or not. Yet God gives them a gracious call to obey. And if, the, if they were obedient, verse 12 tells us that all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight. If they were obedient, other nations will see the land freed from the devouring locusts and other hurtful creatures yielding a large increase. Neighboring nations who 
seeing their prosperity, would desire to dwell with them. And so God will open the floodgates of heaven and bless Israel if they were obedient that time. And the same language that was used here is the same language used in Genesis chapter 7 in the time of Noah when the floodgates of heaven were opened and the rain fell upon the earth. So in the time of the flood, they were opened for man's destruction. Now God would reign abundantly with blessings if they were obedient. Now again, we clearly see in these passages and in the rest of the Bible that God is always faithful to His covenant. That even when the people are not, Israel would fail again, and we will see that in the Gospels when they finally fail, when they reject their Messiah. Even if they fail, we see God's plan in Christ. When we see Christ who gave himself generously as a sacrifice even unto death, out of obedience to his Father. And in his sacrifice, he became the generous outpouring of heavenly blessing that God bestowed on his people. He is the blessing that we all need. Hindi ginto ang dapat pumasok sa utak natin when the Bible says the floodgates of heaven will come down, will 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 mag mag mag, mag bababa ng blessing sa panginoon. You open yung ang floodgates of heaven. Hindi dapat ginto o material things or resources ang may isip natin. Rather, it is God Himself who came down and gave us what we all need. Not wealth. We don't, we, we don't need wealth. We need salvation. Hindi natin kailangan ng kayamanan. Kailangan natin ng kaligtasan. Because we need to be saved from our wretchedness. We need to be saved from the bondage of sin. We need to be saved from the power of sin. We need to be saved from the presence of sin. And in Christ, the outpouring blessing of heaven, in Christ we are the recipients of the blessings that comes with His sacrifice on the cross. In Christ, we are now at peace and reconciled. And we have been reconciled with God. We were, in fact, at war with Him. Now we don't just have that peace, but now we can have that access to God the Father. and We can call Him Abba Father because we have been adopted to His family, because we have been ushered into His kingdom. And in Christ, we are now justified because of the righteousness of Christ that He Himself attained for living a sinless life. And in Christ, we are now freed from the bondage of sin. We can now please God by obeying His laws. And in Christ, we are being sanctified with God the Holy Spirit enabling us to mortify our sins and cultivate graces or doing the opposites of sin. And in Christ, we will be resurrected. We will be glorified for Christ himself was the first fruit of, of resurrection to give us hope that we have eternal life with him. So friends, therefore, since Christ is the covenantal blessing, we should respond by serving God in the church, by ministering to one another, and also by giving. We should give not like how Israel was obliged to tithe, but we should give because He has already given us the inexpressible gift realized in the person and work of Jesus Christ. While we are not required to give a specific tenth of our income, it is hard to think. It is hard to think of a normal Christian blessed with the fullness of the gospel of Christ, doing less. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 to 16 tells us, Through Him, through Him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now giving then is not just an obligation for a member of a church but it is an act of worship 
It is an act of response to what Christ has done. And as an act of worship, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter, 6, chapter 9, verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, if you have debts, you should pay your debts first before you even give to the church. And so giving voluntarily, generously, joyfully, and sacrificially is worship that God accepts. Yet again, the scripture tells us of our responsibility in the local church. And so part of what God requires of his true worshipers is the regular proportionate giving according to our means. But cheerful giving of one's substance is commended. And if you are a member of a local church, then you should look, you should look at this as a responsibility. We have a responsibility to preserve the word ministry in our local church. For a church that understands and is well giving in materials is a church that is well fed spiritually. And at the same time, you should look at this as a response based on the greater blessings we got in the new covenant of grace in Christ. Sabi ni Paul, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, that yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is not material wealth. It is because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice that Paul is certain of God's covenant blessings. Our hearts too should be assured of His goodwill toward us when we follow His word. We can love because He first loved us. We are empowered by the Spirit to give because He first gave us Christ. And what a great reminder that even in our giving, we still look to the first giver, the one who gave himself for us, that we may be rich with the spiritual blessings that we now appreciate and enjoy, that peace and reconciliation with God. And so if our church is well informed about this, if our church is obedient to the cause of Christ, then our church will be persevering, faithful to the word, gospel-centered, and a soul-winning church. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, for the reminder of our responsibility to preserve your ministry through giving. And Lord, may we do this as an act of worship. May we do this not out of compulsory. Lord, may we do this cheerfully. May we do this as a response to the greater blessings that we have received in Christ. Lord, we thank you that even in this act of worship, you still call us to look to Christ because he is the one who gave himself for us as a sacrifice to pay the penalty of our sins just so we can enjoy and appreciate your spiritual blessings. We thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen.